Hey guys, I'm Michael Wright, and today I'm going to be doing something special for you patrons out there. Now, I'm going to be having this about a week or so early for you guys before anybody else gets to see this. This is a series for you guys. Thank you guys for supporting me. Doesn't matter how many patrons we're going to have, I'm going to do a video at least once every other week, if not once every week, depending on my schedule, of course. And this specific series is going to be called Unbreakable Board Games, and the topic is Designing for Balance. Now, when you think about a board game, you maybe or maybe do not think about math as a core concept to board games, but math is in, in whole the most important part to mechanics for board games. And balancing is the reasoning behind it. Now, there's multiple types of balancing in games and some people could lump them into even more categories or less categories, but I've kind of made my own list of balancing. The first one is going to be card value and weight. The next one we'll talk about is going to be called balance of choice and then asymmetrical balance and symmetrical balance. Those are the four different balances we'll talk about in games because I think it's really important for those of you who want to design games or just want a good game, want to know why a game didn't turn out as well as you thought it would, balance is very, very important when it comes to the mechanics of the game. And if you're playing a game and you start to realize that this is unfair, or that is unfair, that's probably because the game is unbalanced or not balanced in the way you'd like it to be. So normally when we talk about balance, let's talk about choice. The first one, example one, is going to be choice A is equal to one and choice B is equal to one. Now they're both different choices, but they are valued at the same. Another option for balancing is choice A is equal to one and that choice costs one. Whereas choice B is equal to two, but it costs 1.5 or maybe it costs two. Now that's depending on what type of example we're gonna be going for balancing. But in general, the higher the uh, cost of something in a board game, the more value you're gonna get out of it. And in fact, usually the cost is gonna be slightly less than the value of something. Normally there's a base value. So let's go ahead and talk about card weight or card value. It's one of the most basic concepts in board game design. And in fact, one of the most basic concepts in any type of TCG or LCD you're gonna run into. And that is gonna take you to my favorite card game that has ever been designed for various good reasons, but that is Magic the Gathering. And I've got a lot of Magic the Gathering cards. I've had them for a very long time. Oh no. But nevertheless, they have, they have a cost to them. When you think of Magic, and even if you've never played the game before, you're gonna think of cost, and then you're gonna think of what you get out of it, which is value. The cost is gonna be mana, or we can just say cash, and the value is what we're gonna say is either the card's text and or its attack slash defense value. In Magic, generally speaking, if you spend one mana or one money, you're going to get out of it a one, one, one attack, one defense. That is a very basic core of magic. You're going to get currency that you can play once a turn for free, and when you use that currency, it's going to refresh on your next turn, and thusly, the cards have a specific weight to them. Now, and when you go to a two costing card, the first thing you think of is a two, two. That's a balance mechanic, right? One for one, one, two for a two, two, three for a three, three. A three, three is always better than a two, two. A two, two is always better than one, one. But with magic, it has something very interesting. It has exact value and choice value. And in magic, it's got a lot of choice value and it has some exact value. If for choice value, for instance, it's going to be like this two, two is worth two. But because it's slightly better than that one cost one one and it took you an extra turn to get it, we're going to add flying to this specific card or some other variable that's going to be added. And that's kind of how it works with magic. And up to the point where you're going to see start seeing some really crazy cards like Decree of Annihilation. That's going to cost you somewhere around 10. But what it does is phenomenal. It removes all cards from everywhere from the game, basically refreshing the game to start all over again because it's very hard to get up to that value. So where normally you never see a card at that value doing that kind of thing if you're looking at it in just exact balance but because of the length of time that is where it, the balance has increased but i think you get the common concept of the uh, card value and a weight of a card let's talk about scaling value 
Scaling value is basically something like Forbidden Island or, uh, for instance, the captain is dead. Wherever I threw this game off, there it is, it's over here. The captain is dead. We'll talk about this one here, but if you've ever played this one or Forbidden Island, you'll understand that in Forbidden Island, as the game progresses, it gets more challenging. You're going to take your actions, and then after that, the card, the game is going to flip over a card, and that card will do something nasty to you. Basically, your actions will be, give you a lot of amount of things you can do, and then the game is going to try and subtract those actions. So for the first certain period, of the game, the first one third of the game, the value of a card that is drawn from the deck is going to be negative three maybe. And then the value of your character is going to be four. So every turn you're going to get at least one value over the game. But on the second third, uh, the second third of the game, then the game's value on their cards is going to increase, thusly making it a little more challenging so that the card value is four and your actions are four, which means that slowly cards are going to start being removed from any of the games. You can think of any of these type of games and you'll kind of get the idea. Pandemic is another one that does this. And then finally, up to the point where it's the last, the end of the game, you're going to have cards from the deck that maybe have a value of five or negative five and your value is still at four. So now you're losing actions as you progress throughout the game. That is still balanced because at the beginning of the game it was giving you bonus actions. The Captain is Dead does that, but it does it in a very dramatic way and it's very, uh, very, very scary. But I think you get the idea of scaling value. Forbidden Island, The Captain is Dead, Pandemic, those are the ones that do that. The next one I want to talk about is called Balance of Choice. Balance of Choice is really cool, and mainly you're going to see this in worker placements. For instance, Evil High Priest, or perhaps a Caverna. In Evil High Priest or Caverna, you're basically going to be placing down characters on spaces. Those spaces will give you something. You place it on choice A, it will give you an apple. You place it on choice B, it will give you two banana. In the game, two banana is basically equivalent to one apple, and that is kind of how worker placement works. Sometimes the game will progressively get bigger and bigger and allow you more choices, and that is based on time, and then as that happens, the choices become a little more valuable. But everyone gets those choices, so the game stays balanced. So an interesting balance of choice. It's one of my favorite types of balancing in card games and in, in, and in board games. That's why I like a lot of worker placement. Asymmetrical balance. Asymmetrical balance is interesting because when you don't, when you think about balance, you think about things that are in symmetry, things that are exact, like chess or Othello, this one over here, or like uh, Catan, right? But let's go and talk about asymmetrical. Basically, games like Root. Root are games that have variable player power. Uh, this character gets to move two spaces, and this player gets to have plus one attack. Plus one attack in this game is equivalent to plus two spaces, even though they are completely separate in terms of what they do. That's basically asymmetrical balance. In fact, with the game Root, this guy over here, you're going to be playing as different characters, and the board is going to have some type of sym symmetry, but the characters and the uh, classes do not. One player might just be playing with one character and a bunch of cards in in his area where another player might be playing with a hundred characters moving around the board doing their thing the way this game balances it which is a little more complex but all the classes are just as valuable as any other class even though none of them are very similar for those of you guys who have played games like this i think you'll understand what asymmetrical balance is there's other things like skull island or you think about trick taking games as well in skull island everybody plays cards down at the same time and then at the same time flips them up a card that has a zero is going to get to go first and a card that has something like a 14 is going to go last so it'll go from ascending order. Cards that are valued at zero are not as strong as cards at 14, but you get to take your actions first with the lower cards. So it gives you choice and makes them fair. It is a interesting way of balancing games and something I enjoy as well. There's a lot of cool games that do that, uh, specifically games that flip over simultaneous, simultaneous action games. Uh, and those are the basic types of asymmetric balance. There's a lot more, and sometimes you'll see asymmetrical balance in games in a small way, like a, just, just little baby cards, little var variable player powers, variable card powers, all that kind of thing. It's, it's an interesting concept, and I really enjoy asymmetrical balance. A symmetrical balance, like I was saying before, is like chess or checkers, things like Othello, things like Abalone, in which the board is exactly the same on each side, and it has this kind of mirrored look to it. You have the same options your opponent has, and it comes down to who's just going to make the best moves possible. You lose due to asymmetric or symmetrical balance by just not playing as good as your opponent. Kind of an interesting concept. I think most of you get that, such as like in the game here for Othello 
classic. This is going to have a square board with a, I think it's like a 10 by 10 grid, and you're gonna get white pieces, your opponent's gonna get black pieces, you're gonna be playing them down. You can play them down anywhere you want. It's a back and forth action, and you're trying to control the entire board with your color, and if you can do that, you win. Most of you probably have played a game like this at some point in the past, and that has an interesting aspect to it as well, right? It all comes down to whoever is the best. And 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 I like balancing games. I think balancing the games works very well, but balance sometimes doesn't need to work well. And there's certain games like I uh, take that card game, for instance, Exploding Kittens, right? There are other games like that that have things that do not balance games. Some people like that, but in my opinion, most of the time, balance is going to lead to a positive player experience. If you're playing a game and it's not balanced, or you play a card, a card gets played on you that is unbalanced, you feel it and you get that negative experience. And negative experiences in gaming is never fun. Uh, for instance, a card might say, do a damage to a player when you play this card. And then another card might say, do five damage to a player. Both of the cards don't cost anything and you can simply just play them. The player who got the five is just straight up going to have a better card than the other player. That's not very balanced, not very fair, and doesn't feel very good. So it's kind of why I wanted to talk about balancing. It's something that I've noticed a lot in games. It's something I focus on and I want to make sure that everything feels balanced. I'm going to talk about balance of choice. Just this last little one here before we cut you off. Uh, is you're, oh, We're going to talk about Kingsburg here. I'm going to try and pull this board out. And this one is a die rolling game, so it has a lot of luck in it, but it is still balanced. You're going to be rolling die, two die, and you're going to place them down on this board based on the cumulative numbers or individual numbers. The higher the cumulative number you get, the better stuff you're going to get, the lower the less stuff you get. But, so it has a little bit of the chance as to the best roll you can get, but it additionally has the same value as if you had, let's say, a three and a, and a four, that would get you these two pieces. Or if you had a four and a four, that's eight, it would get you these two pieces. So it has balance in that way. Interesting, there's a lot of ways balance works in games. And I think, for the most part, a lot of games that do very well are games that balance things differently, that change it up. Whenever you find a new interesting type of balance to a game, such as Root being one of those key ones where you literally have completely different gameplay in front of you, but yet you feel like you just have just as much odds of winning as anybody else. That is what's going to uh, create a really, really fun game. Anyway, I hope you guys had a little fun watching this video. I thought this maybe help you a little bit understand what I think makes an objectively good game most of the time. And whether you agree with me or not, let me know down below. This is gonna be on Patreon first, and then after that, I'm gonna release it all to the public on YouTube, and you guys can go ahead and decide whether you like this or not. The next one I'm going to be doing is probably gonna be based on Oh, I don't know. It's going to be based on theme or it's going to be based on bad game mechanics. Two really important things, I think, as far as board games are concerned. Thank you guys for watching. I really appreciate you guys joining me on Patreon here. Hopefully you guys get to see our next live stream and continue watching Unfiltered Gamer. Thank you so much. Unbreakable Board Games, over and out.